test tape we were trying to figure out exactly how we wanted to run these vents, try to make them relatively scale, but make them functional as well. But what I did here is I laid this out on a previous tape with masking tape to try to get the size I wanted. Now it's going to be a question of I want to cut these out. And what I want to do is maybe make myself a little sanding tool that'll be this relative size or close to it so I can get in there and get a nice smooth transition into the wood. I thought would be an okay way to do this is I laid the line out. I'm going to make these a little bit smaller than the line to start with. Because I have to cut through that multi-layered balsa. Don't want to go all the way. And because I'm going to have to do a lot of these, I may as well make the proper tooling. Now I'm going to have to cut this way back because I need to put an edge on there. So I'll leave a little extra material there. And one of the things this will allow me to do is get inside and glue these joints from the inside. A little side benefit of doing it this way. And once I do one of these, and I can come up with the right size sanding tool, Again, this is not only just for appearance, this has to flow some air, too. Now I can try to get this angle, get some of this sanded away, cut away first. What I want to do is, I want to get these flats. I guess this tool will be good enough for now. I've left the tape on so I can feel the edge when I'm coming up on the edge here. Well, the next step is going to be to get some small pieces of 64th plywood and try to make up a little piece of 64th plywood that will go in there. And again, because I want edges at 64th plywood, I want them to be close to being the right size. And then I can trim that, hopefully trim that off in one, one giant slice. tool seems to be working pretty well, so I think well, until we find a reason not to use it, it's got nice 90 degree edges. That'll give us some nice 90 degrees up there. Now to cut the plywood, and I want to get this, I want this to be a flat. I don't want to just have it touching on a little area. I want it to be touching on two flats. Let's just see how thick that has to be. Well, the easiest way to do this is just to strip off a big long piece and then cut it to length each time I put a piece in there because you can use up scraps and it'll say this is 64th plywood. It's always good to cut the piece a little bit oversized. In this case it just won't fit in there. Again, because I'd like to get nice tight fits, there's going to be some structural integrity here will be going one way. And we got to take just, just a little more off. Well, of course, because we want all these to be even, I want to set one, one dimension and then make each one exactly the same, hopefully, except for the bottom one. So having a pattern, I guess this is going to help me establish exactly where I want that piece to be. I'm getting the last little bit. Now the nice thing about 64 plywood here, if we were to make these out of balsa, they wouldn't be as strong, of course. 
and they would need a lot more finishing. Just a couple of coats of dope will finish that up relatively nice. See, I'm still on the tight side here. I'm going to have to take probably just the amount of the line off. Just the amount of the line will have to come off. Because I wanted a tight fit here, I really didn't want to force this in. There we go. Now we get it. So important to get a 90 degree edge on this. I don't want to have it off because this edge, if it's slanted, it's not going to make a nice joint in the final finish. Now I'm just going to put a little bit of thick CA in here. I don't want to have it overflowing either. I just don't want to have a big drool going down the side here. Now once this kicks off, and I'm trying not to use kicker, then I'll make these little triangle pieces for each edge. Now this is going to be pretty time consuming, I can see by how long it's taken me just to do one of these and I have a dozen or so to do two dozen, I don't know. And we can cut this just a tad oversize. thing is to make up a little pattern, always leaving it oversized so you have a little piece to hold. Let's see if we have the angle right here. Uh, a little bit less. Once I make a pattern up for this, hopefully I can uh, then just grind up or cut up a couple dozen of these all at once. But you certainly need a pattern to start with before you can do anything. And also I'd like to try to keep them as symmetrical as possible so the angle is the same or very close. Okay, so that's going to be from here. Now because this is a pattern, now I can just go cut and use up my scrap pieces as long as I have a little tab to hold that on to while I'm gluing these in. Got a bunch of these up from scrap that'll save a little time. Anyway, now what this is going to need next is just a final sanding in. And we should be uh, then looking at making dum -dum 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 a dozen more of them off camera. I'm usually, <clears throat> usually pretty uh, adept at figuring out when something's going to take longer than I originally thought it would. And believe me, I can see already, this is going to take longer than I thought it would. This is going to be a very long, long day to do how many I have to do with these. But I'll patiently do them off camera, one by one, which is always good news. Because I can see already, these are going to be boring. So what's good, when you're doing this kind of work, now this is equivalent to sanding silver or something. You can fall asleep, watch some Reno videos, watch train videos, whatever, as you're doing this. And I just need to get this little piece. I don't want to change that cowling edge because I had a pretty nice fit. Well, you can pretty much picture what once a dozen of these are in, or how many. And we'll see how that's going to look at the end of this day. Now, 
this is just how wanted events would work. Of course, we're going to have a lot of them. Pulling that hot air out, hopefully. I don't know, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking that's going to look pretty good when it's going. And of course, I'll have to get them all in on one side before I make that decision. But that's, I think that's going to be okay. And it certainly is going to have the look. The look is going to be fine. All right. So again, it's just a question of toughing out a couple of days, or maybe, maybe even longer, doing these. They're going to be time consuming. I know it, but it's going to be a nice little detail in the in the model. Certainly, a little defining detail. Now believe me, what you're looking at here is a couple hours of work. This is really, I know I've said it before, this is really taking longer than I thought, but I really think that is going to be really nice when it's done. That's going to have a really nice, unique look. The only trouble is it just, just takes a long time, and I guess I just should be more patient than I am. They get so excited about working on this now. Hey, and another little tidbit, anybody that doesn't know, or former Pampa President Steve Busso, good friend of us, recovering from chemotherapy and is finished and the prognosis is that we're going to see him this summer fly and he's already building another plane so congratulations Steve good to hear you're doing well the other thing is when I know there's a job this long I'm always tempted to want to stay up and finish it in one session or rush through it or something well the reality of the whole thing is I'm probably going to finish one of these today maybe but I'm definitely not going to get both of them done. So knowing that ahead of time, I may as well just back off a little bit. I thought for a minute I was going to get both of these done. <laughs> Where do you start doing these and sanding them in? You'll see. But I really think for a, for a kind of a semi-scale look, that's going to be real nice. We'll see when we finish one of these up. Even though this took me, uh, well, it took me a lot of, a lot more time than I thought it would. I'm real happy with the way this is looking. And this tool is excellent. Now, another trick, whenever you're using 64th plywood, every time you sand it, you have to break the edge. Otherwise, what's going to happen is we're going to wind up with a very sharp edge. And as soon as you touch that or go to buff it, that edge is going to come through. You need to start right in the very beginning, build up a radius on all these points. What will amount to be points. And also, every time I've done one of these, I've been kind of just dressing this off to try to keep that as a nice fit. Make sure all of these are nice and all those edges. If they if they have a razor sharp edge, as soon as you put dope on it and you go to touch it with sandpaper, it's going to come off, and you're going to have a buff through. Every step of this now, now that we have most of this, this will make all the corners sharp. Every time I sand this radius, it's going to make them sharp. But then I need to go back and dress each one of these corners off, put a radius on it. Now I really, again, underestimated how long this would take, but it is truly one of the features, as Dave Downey used to call them, the uh, defining features of the model. And even though I, I really put a lot of time into just figuring out what shape and size these should be, and they're certainly not scale, 
But when you look at it, you sure get the impression that that's what it looks like. And also, when these are airbrushed with the exhaust stains, this little tool works out real well. A little poly work for getting in the corners. Now the last thing I'm going to do here what I want to do to each one of these segments let me get a couple of these and I would I would always recommend anytime you have 64th plywood what happens you have end grain now coming through on all the edges so what I'll do one by one is break the edge Give it just a little bit of a radius, ever so little of a radius. What this does, it seals up the end grain. Now, as soon as that, actually, it's only going to take a second or two. Now I need to go back into each segment and put that radius back on. First I radius the wood, and once the CA seals it, I re-radius each one of the edges. And if I do that to each one of the parts, each one of these little segments, that's definitely going to finish me up for the night. Because we definitely need to constantly now, from this point on, maintain that radius. That is going to be so important. That's really going to look, when that's, when that's assembled up, and all the ink line and the front of the cows are painted a, uh, a bright color, I think that's going to be pretty good. I think that should give us, especially down by the head of the motor, adequate cooling. And one of the things that I think is going to really look nice when it's all finished, the look from the back, actually looking down into the scoops. Anyway, now there's only one one thing left. Let's do the other one. So we'll set aside a whole work session and maybe try to do this in one session. Usually the second part goes faster than the first, but I would think right now that's that's looking just about as good as I think it's going to look. And I can't wait to get the second one done on this. And we'll come down and finish this tomorrow. Hopefully, and hopefully it won't snow anymore. Now today I got something really special in the mail from good friend Bill Zimmer. Now, you may not you may not see him in a lot of the pictures because he's been judging I think since forever he's retired now from judging but uh, we do share some videos and we share some stuff and I don't know if he's in this picture it's too hard for me to see hard to tell this is the 83 Nats bill I hope you probably just added a picture anyway he's a good friend of Kenny Stout who was a good friend of mine too but we share a lot of other common interests and this is something I I really was blown away by this. This is one of the things like when Bob uh, Zamboli sent me that Ferrari footage of the guy driving through Paris. It just, it's so over the top, you'll have to, you, you just have to appreciate that the guy did this. Anyway, reading, uh, reading from, uh, from Bill Zimmer's note. Bill, Bill, of course, has a big collection of railroad videos, real railroad videos. And over the years, we've shared some of them. This this is one I had never <coughs> I had never seen before. <coughs> Boy, I'm all stuffed up this morning. Anyway, this guy's a world 
uh, renowned photographer who basically is, uh, well, he's the windy video of the 50s of steam engines for the Santa Fe Railroad. And what he did, he did something similar to what I did. He got up on the tender and then up on the engine of the locomotive to shoot some home movies, which now, if we had never had these, uh, you know, I certainly I'd be poor. But anyway, I am just blown away by the the name is his name is J. Allen Hawkins, and he had a five-man crew, especially shot. This is the last run over El Cajon Pass. But if you look, it's what's really impressive about this video is the way they shot the footage. And take a few minutes. This is really even if you don't have any interest in railroading, you gotta admit these guys were pretty cool. From our friend Bill Zimmer, and by the way, Bill is a nominee, I believe, for the Hall of Fame for Pampa this year. He just received a special award from his club from the Flyers at the Nats. He is certainly one of the most deserving people that will ever be in the Hall of Fame. When I was the F2B chairman, he had written a lot of the rules. He served as a judge and as in, in every other function for many, many years. Anyway, enjoy a couple minutes of this footage. This is cool stuff. I don't think you'll ever... This guy is like the windy video of his time, of the 50s. crew settles down to their duties. Engineer Howard Bryant has made this run many times in the past, as has fireman Clyde Kyle. Murdoch is riding along to ensure that everything goes smoothly for this special train movement. Santa Fe and the Railway Club of Southern California, particularly Club President John Ferris, have worked long and hard together to iron out every detail connected to this excursion, including the temporary installation of automatic train stop equipment at the club's expense. In order to fully document this trip, Al Hawkins has stationed cameramen aboard the train and its strategic trackside locations along the right-of-way. Currently riding in the cab, Hawkins will later climb out onto the tender to capture some truly dramatic footage. Tender to record the action, a 3759 charges the stiff grade with a full head of steam. A unique vantage point will reward him with some truly breathtaking footage. At this point, the grade is already 2.2%, and soon due to get worse as a steady parade of cars pays the train from the highway running alongside. Many of the chase cars have fallen behind by the time 3759 and her team reach the war. Both Santa Fe and Union Pacific use this trackage, and meets have to be carefully coordinated. Even without special train movements such as 3759, 
the home pass from the dispatcher's nightmare. Ukraine is facing for full sighting on the hill. There are a number of spur tracks at this location, including one from a nearby World War II Army base. Meanwhile, Al Hawkins has been joined topside by a second cameraman. crosses the home creek as the tracks run along the west side of the wash. Al Hawkins captures the footage from on top of 3759's cab. Maintaining a precarious balance, facing into a steady mixture of wind, steam, and oil smoke, Hawkins gives new meaning to the word dedication as the train continues its climb through a wild, remote countryside. Train approaches Teambrook, one of the two remaining water tanks can just be seen off to the left. <laughs> Further on, 3759 meets a downhill freight powered by a four-unit diesel lash-up during Santa Fe's blue and yellow freight scheme. The engine works its way up a 2.2% grade, pulling hard as it enters the blue cut area. Santa Fe's route through here closely parallels the San Andreas fault line. In fact, the fault runs directly beneath the creek bed off to the side. As the plane winds its tortuous way upgrade, Al Hawkins and his fellow daredevil go to incredible lengths to capture the drama unfolding around them. Another downhill freight waits in the siding with the horn while 3759 pulls by. Entering the 10 degree curve, 3759 heads for Sullivan's curve, named for Pine, the real photographer Herb Sullivan. This was the setting for many of Sullivan's most memorable shots. Ten years after his death, 3759 leads her train through the curve Sullivan immortalized. More cars and spectators line Highway 138's grade crossing as 3759 approaches. Once again, cameras click as the train continues uphill toward Pine Lodge and another crossing of Cajun Creek. Here's 
also contains heavy volume of rail traffic, trains run with extremely close headways. En route to all way, on a scheduled photo run by, 3759 overtakes an uphill freight running on the opposite mean. The freight will stop while 3759 completes her run by. by several different trackside cameras, 3759 fits on a spectacular show. Further downgrade, the train crosses the Mojave River at a point known as the Lower Narrows, east of Victorville. Soon 3759 will pick up speed, and Al Hawkins will shoot some of his riskiest, most dramatic footage. The speed limit across this portion of the Mojave Desert is 100 miles per hour. Al Hawkins pushes the top 3759 as it races through the desert at speeds which continually approach that limit. A constant headwind whips dust, smoke, and steam across Hawkins as he films the spectacle of high-speed power. The train rockets its way across the Mojave, and somehow Hawkins manages to stay aboard and keep shooting. Slowing down considerably, the train approaches Barstow for its scheduled 12.30 arrival. This is the train's turnaround point, and most of its passengers are probably looking forward to the leisurely lunch at the Harvey House as the train slips its way into the yard. While the passengers eat, the train will be serviced and made ready for its return trip to Los Angeles. Pounds away up to 1.6% grade east of Summit. She is a study in majesty as she works her final miles. To some passengers, she trip may already be taking on a dream-like quality, even as the excursion winds its way back across the home. After today's run, her 26-year career will officially be over. 
But if we're wrong here tomorrow for 3759, she still has the rest of today. And she will make the most of it, arriving at San Bernardino at 4.15 and Pasadena at 5.45, before finally tying up for the last time in Los Angeles at 6.15. As the night approaches, her final run is already an historic triumph. No one can ever forget Santa Fe's 37.59 on the final run over Cajon Pass. some fabulous, fabulous footage. I will treasure it always. And by the way, I am one of the people that gets to vote on the AM, on the uh, Pampa Hall of Fame as a District 2 director, and you certainly, certainly have my vote when it comes time. Anyway, thanks to Bill Zimmer. Let's get back to working on the bomber. Tomorrow is the big show and tell, our annual show and tell at Wendy's, and we want to get ready for it. Now, as I said before, Bill Hummel, Noel Drindak, Mike Costello, maybe even Lampione, they're going to come down. Once a year we try to have a show and tell pizza party at Wendy's. I rent out the local pizza place, uh, the back room. Last year we had 14 people show up. This year I don't know how many will show up, but we'd like to see all the people, the new planes that they're working on. And by the way, this is great footage to be watching over and over and over while you're doing some boring, redundant work like this. And I was hoping I'd finish this part of it up in the course of the day. If I don't, that's too bad. If I do, that's great. Wanted to finish up the second one so we could show this wing. We have Mike's other wing. And for the other people that enjoy show and tell, we usually enjoy taking it, taking a, the pieces apart and looking at them and probing them and looking at them and whatever. Every time I look at the way this venting worked out, though, I, I'm just more and more satisfied that the effort, even though this is going to be probably three or four full days of work to get that venting in, it really looks like that's going to add a real special touch to the airplane. And the thing with all of this stuff that I find is you have to do it with passion and you have to do it without care and how long it takes. If you start looking at the clock and start adding up the hours, you just can't build planes of this caliber. To quote the Ducati factory rep, you have to build a motorcycle as if time doesn't exist. And that's really how you have to approach a twin engine bomber too. We'll give it our best shot and see if we can finish it up. But we're going to be watching that railroad video over and over again. That was just one fabulous video. I think the for me, the key to life, the key to being happy is to have a lot of interests in life and pursue them all with passion. And that's really worked for me over the years. So I'm going to get back. Instead of talking and shooting video and watching Bill Zimmer's video, i got to get back to working on this. Tomorrow is our big show and tell day. I can't wait. Look forward to this every year. But finally, after so many hours, the moment of truth has arrived. Both sides are done. I did some final fitting and sanding along the edges here, but we'll save the majority of it for when we actually get the silk spin on here to get the blend right to the thickness of a piece of paper. I think the air venting part of this is going to be exceptional. And it certainly will be a little more aerodynamic not having the cowl flaps open. But again, because we're trying to prepare, I want to clean up the shop here before our show and tell tomorrow. Less is due to bring over some of his parts that he's been working on. But getting this part done, this has just been a major, major thing. 
I had no idea when I started this how many, I keep saying it over and over, how many hours this took. It was well worth it. I think that's going to really add a nice definitive, uh, I don't know what you would call it, one of the definitive parts of the model, just like it on the B25, there are so many definitive parts. You really can't skip them, you know, you really can't, you wish you could start making a semi-scale model and then just leave off all the details. Well, that's just not one of the things that's going to happen. And when I look down at this, when these are in flight, I think those things are going to look pretty neat in flight. But again, we'll see. We're really not making these models to please anybody but, uh, anybody but me, really. <laughs> hey, and I'm not kidding about Bill Zimmer. Bill Zimmer is one of the the real heroes of the event, a lot of years of dedicated service, and he will get my vote for that Pampa Hall of Fame. Anyway, again, thanks for the video. Thanks for joining us. It has been great. Bill, I've been wearing out these videos. <laughs> it's really cool. Mr. Hunt says to make it. By the way, with the landing gear blocks, everything in it, just as you see it, it's six and a quarter ounces. Yeah, so it's not that much heavier than a foam wing, so what's the problem? You don't have the sheeting on, and you don't it's, have... It's not... It's a you don't have the belt crank in there? No. Well, no, the, the sheeting is on. That's what I meant, that it's lighter, so... That looks fine. But look at this. If a wing is going to fold, here's your belt crank mount. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, I now... See. Before you put the bell crank in, what makes design this to be made this way, but you take out this center rib. Okay, I'm watching. All right, because the neat part about it is what you now have rib support back in under the sheeting. All right, so you don't have two pieces of sheeting just flopping around. You've got a little a tongue and right. thing going So you, you cut these out, you know, top and bottom. Now, here's your bell crank mat and what he calls a tension spar. Well, what is that made out of? What I made it, this, or is just, this is just bass. Okay? Okay. Now, it gets its strength from two areas. With this gone, it glues to this rib, this rib, this rib, and this rib. But only, your only glue surfaces are here, but also the front of it glues to the spar. Okay? Now, I'm thinking, this doesn't weigh spit, by the way. I'm thinking, if this it nestles in here like this, Okay. Take another piece, almost this size, run it deeper, and run it out. Rather than have it terminate here, terminate it here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you glue the two of them together, we got that carbon fiber in between them. That gives you several things. It gives you one more rib to glue on. You bet. And it gives you more frontal area right here. And because it's tapered. You don't have an abrupt stress, mm. stress riser. But whenever these wings break, Bob McDonald's and several others, they break right here. Well, this is the stress that, riser. So by you bringing this out... It comes out to here now. Okay, or even what I would do is I'd extend the sheeting out one more rib. Just how the hell much is that going to weigh? Well, I, I don't think the sheeting gives it that much more strength. Well, but I'm saying you've concentrated all of the things... Well, then in I, one area Then here. I got the problem of taking that calf strip off. Here's, here's the way you tell. When you, sh when you put the tissue on one of these wings, you put something under that end and press down in the middle, and you see it always wrinkles the tissue right here. Yeah. And by the way, the way I know this, the way I know I have a good idea where wings break, because I've broken a lot of them. You want to see one that broke? This guy here broke. This is this is my uh, incredible uh, top first top five plane. Broke. Broke right where the sheeting ended, right here, just like Bob McDonald's did. You know, so... That, that whole year of work went down the drain. Sure, I got the top five, but who cares? You know, I wanted the plane. Well, I would think, that, bless, in my way of looking at this, you, what you're doing is exactly right. I would continue that out. I would also, from this, maybe from this rib to here, put the sheeting glue on already? Yeah. Too bad you can't get underneath there and get a piece of that carbon in there. Well, well you know, better way. This would be a definitely an improvement. All right, so what we need is a piece of... Uh, what is that, eighth inch? No, it's not even. It looks Ooh. like three thirty seconds bass. I can't remember where I cut this out of. How much? I just want to know something. Let me just see something. You would effectively be doubling the rate of this. 
You've got uh, one. You've, uh, what is this? Two grams or something? Oh, five grams. Oh, seventy-seven. I don't know. Yeah. Let, I'll tell you what. We're going to take the spar and we're going to take the sheeting. I mean, I'll give you an example of something. Remember, a nobler is double sheeted in the middle. A nobler is yep. double sheeted. So just think of this. How much is that way? Working on the sheeting and the spar. Sheeting and the spar. Six point two. So you're going to add six, six grams to the wing, and, and for an insurance policy. You know how much? Just to give you an example of how, how crazy this is. If you want to carry six grams more weight, move this rib out a sixteenth of an inch and you got it. Yeah. That, I mean, proportionally, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So I got, we got, uh, we have some 077 here. Yeah. So what we need is some ply and the carbon fiber. Hmm, that's a nice straight wing. That's not bad. There's nothing wrong with that. No. Nope. Sheeting on the front's beautiful. Everything's nice about it. I just, well, I, I just get weary about those center sections. <laughs> I'll tell you something. We're going to have a problem when I finish this. When Noel did this, ask Noel too. He had some trick under here because these are all. But this he one, was not happy with that. This won't. Yeah, but I, he probably used sixteenth. No, I don't know what he used. Let's see how the gear blocks look on this. this standard, size. standard, Bobby. Okay, that's nice. Now you see, feel this right here. Here's the seam. And this is gonna. This is gonna. Oh yeah, that's gonna. That's gonna want to. Uh, well, good. It's on the bottom of the plane too. Yeah. Yeah, that's and the good. only thing I had when I when I put this together, the only thing I had were these screws. I got to get cap screws in there. And I got I got the cap screws for you. Aluminum cap screws too. That's all you need for in there. Yeah. Now, needless to say, less less won't tell you, but he came over here. What what is the weather like out today? <laughs> We were looking at Houston. It's raining in Houston. We have an ice storm. Everybody's canceled out today. I think our show and tell is now just no show, no tell, no nothing. Did uh, Hummel call? Yes, he said snowing like crazy up yeah, by him. Yeah. He canceled the whole thing. Next week he's going to try to come down. All right. Well, listen, we got to get this solved here today. And yeah, for sure. For sure. In other words, what I think, if you just did it the way that is, you it's risky. Look, how strong is that? Oh, come on. I could break that. Sure. I'm the... I'm just going easy. The real nice water. thing would have been is bef when this spar was in, when that was in, is to take, I'd say, from where the gear are, a piece of that carbon fiber laminated in between yeah. the spar. Yeah. That, that's the bulletproof way. I, I would, to tell you the truth, there's nothing wrong with that carbon fiber, a quarter inch wide strip, yeah. 7,000. You're never going to break that. Well, not only that. Uh, Another thing, Joe, like Joe and I, we made the cardinal rings, we just put spruce spars in them, and that was. Yeah. Almost, you now, couldn't even wait. One much thing that's was. a little unusual about this wing, look at look at the the back edge of the leading edge sheeting. This spar isn't like this; it's straight. Did you want it that way? That's that's the way Bob designed it. I said, oh. you know, cut me the the system, and I can make this. You know, I got all the stuff for at home. Yeah, but you know what? This is going to happen. Is out here. These ribs are all going to because this the sheeting should go back. Uh, it, this is going to look, this is going to look, well. We'll see. We'll see. His, his thing is that it's as strong and it uses less sheeting. Yeah, but the small amount of this. Yeah. You're going to make yet, it up for sanding. And yet I got an SV-22 set home, you know, to make an SV-22 right. wing. Right. And he uses it the same way Randy did. This, by the way, is the way Werewitch built his. If you look at the GOXL, the plans for that, okay. that he builds with a straight spar. But this is your that's F oil, right? That's a carry carryover. This essentially is a Saturn. Okay. And how thick is it in the middle? Uh, like over two. It's over two? Two and a sixteenth, two and an eighth. Okay. Not awfully thick. Hmm. Not awfully thick. The only downside of that whole thing is you got to make the plane light. That's, you know... If you can do it, that's great. But it's well, like I, I think this is a good start, you know, for a light plane. You yes. Gear blocks, everything yes. at six and a half. You're doing something. Well, the only real way I know is when that wing is in silver. When it's in silver, then we got something to compare it to. When it's when it's like this, you don't have a lot of parts. And where the where it picks up a lot of weight is because you can never sand out these corners. 
you always wind up with radiuses of unsanded paint in here. And so, if you factor that in as what the other rib would weigh, it's 50-50. Well, I had a conversation with Randy Smith the other day, right? Yeah. And I was talking to him about, you know, these wings versus the foam. Mm. And he said, Les, when you get done with foam, he said, when they build a real airplane, everything is stressed skin. Right. Okay? Right. He said, when you get done with foam, by the time you, you sand it, you can put a lighter finish on a foam wing because you can sand more of it off. As oh, by far. There's no little corner. Oh, yeah. Stuff like that. And wait do you see what happens if you poke a hole in the goddamn thing. And he thing. said, it's rigid. You know, because... Uh, like anything, it's a compromise. Yeah. You know, and by the way, I got to tell you, because I don't see this in magazines all the time. Guess who made the first Geo wing that I know of? 84. I, well, maybe 83, because Billy and I both had them. Made by 84. Billy still got his, I think. I made a geo wing, and I didn't do it the way, when I did it kind of a crude way. I took a foam wing and just cut it up, and made, which which evolved into this, but yeah. it doesn't really matter. It's just the same thing. Because the RC and free flight guys have probably been doing this for 50 years. But what's, what's I just don't like the idea that when you look at this from the front, out here you can see the cap strips. You can't see them in the middle, but you see them out here. Before, so, because of the straight... Yeah, the straight I don't know. Well, we're going to see when you're done with it. We'll I'm, see. I'm firmly convinced that uh, Bob used this because Billy used it, and it's a carryover from an I-beam. Because mm, that's how you build an I-beam spark, dead nut straight. The first one Billy Woolwich had, the first one Billy had, had no sheeting. He, these ribs came up to the front. And that was the, let's see what year... I could remember. The plane had twin tails. Then he oh, changed yeah, yeah, the okay. tails. He changed the tails. Well, put, that was the, one tail on it. was the that. first USA. No, not an 84. That, uh, I can't remember what that was. I'd have to I remember need, what I it was. Coffee. It's, it's, it's no right here. Look, he I says need, he needs coffee. I need coffee. Look, you got to drink it to oh, make it work. Good. Listen, my feet are wet. I could pour some coffee in each <laughs> shoe. It would be nice. Chicky, it's raining outside? But you're an indoor bird. You get this. He's eating grapes. What's up? What's on the menu oh, today? The other, the other thing I need to take with me. Lend me a carbide ball so I can. Oh yeah, do take them. Take the whole thing here if you need it. No, no, I don't need the whole thing. I just I, need. These are great, by the way. They gave me this as an award one year. Windy. Windy, you're a cool guy. I've used it as tools forever. <laughs> they make one. There it is. Well, take it. Whichever one you no, know. No, I want to These are carbide. No, no. Never wear them out. No, there's one that looks like it's got little diamonds on the outside. The next job of this illustrious building session in the rain, Wes has taken some of them. How much did you take off? A quarter of an inch off the trailing edge? Actually, I took off... Uh, he actually did it with a ruler, but we just couldn't We couldn't photograph it while he was... He's going through into the second sheet, and what we're going to do is true this up. The reason is this is an airfoil that's very thin in the back, and you really couldn't even use quarter-inch flaps on it, could you? I'd have to use a thin quarter-inch. Thin like. quarter-inch flaps, and I didn't... Uh, so this should give you a little more thickness at the flap line. Exactly. Are you going to make built-up flaps? No. I have some nice... Contest 5 sixteenths at home. Some of that nice stuff, uh, northern, was it northeast yeah, balsa? From, uh, yeah, he had some nice, I know that batch, the last batch you had, had some nice stuff. By the way, I got another, I got another batch of motor mounts for him. Yeah. For as good as the first ones are, well, his wife took the order, and I think there's the problem. I remember he especially cut that half by half by 15 for Right. Him. Well, she said, oh, well, could we make it? Because they don't show half by half. They show half right. by three-eighths. I figured you'd have to custom cut them. Sure. She said, well, could we make them 18? I said, fine, whatever. I can always cut them. You know, can't sure. make them longer. But no, no, no. Well, he sent me half by half that was twisted, bent right. I'm sure it was pre-cut right off the shelf, and it was terrible. Really? Yeah, so i got to give him a call. And so you got to buy your motor mounts from Wendy from now. <laughs> yeah. Well, when John Gayuski was cutting the mounts, he really, he had that down to a science. Boy. Well, I'm sure what he did also was that he, uh... See, it isn't the milled. cut. No, it's what it is. The hardwood changes with the humidity. Not only with the humidity, you heat, it changes with the blade. John used to cut them. He'd store them in the cellar where it was damp and cut them. He'd buy the wood, then store it in a damp cellar, and then cut it. And then I'd take them and go store them in the attic, and they'd 
they turn into pretzels. So I had a storm in the same humidity. So a lot of times when you ship somebody a motor mount and they put it on a you know in a hot climate that's dry, they twist. Yeah. All right, that part's coming right off here. Not as even as I want it. That's okay. But you're gonna true it up anyway. Yeah. Actually, pretty consistent on the one that cut. If you were an outdoor bird, you'd be freezing today. You'd be out there. Can't use for anything. Can freezing. Hey, what's happening here? Why is this not sitting straight? Wait a minute, Wes, wait a minute. My what? side, there's something wrong underneath here. Look on. Something's under there? No. No. But what, okay, it should be sitting dead flat. It's not well, sitting flat now. Where is it up? Well, let it go. Let it go. Okay, my end is up. See what, when you relieve the stress seconds. in the water, yeah. it's up an eighth of an inch now. Yeah. Well, this is going on the, I think that's the only way to do it. Well, because what happens is we are now shorter than the foam. Well, you what you have to do now, if you want to do this right, is cut a piece of the foam off. The uh, same. I'm not. You don't want to do that. Okay. I'm not now. Uh, yeah, that may be, that may account for why we're jumping up yeah, and down I'll, here. What I'll do is I can. What I'll do is set up the the fence on the bandsaw at home and take a quarter of an inch off, and I'll be ready for the next the next wing. I all right. Out. So use it on the table, and that's yeah. all. Boy, that's I'm trailing it. Sharply. Well, you're always, you're always, it follows the grain of the wood is what happens. Okay, well, we'll Pardon me, Matt. You want to screw that rib, hold it. Your end rib is falling apart. Yep. Glue, put a little CA on that. Oh, okay, so what? Anytime you have to make two parts the same, this is not a real high-tech thing, but it's easy to figure out. If you if you cut two parts out and you laminate them together, a lot of times they don't exactly line up. An easier way is cut one to shape, laminate the material in, and then just trim the second one to the first one, which is what Les is doing. You got to cut four of these now, you said? Total four. Total, yeah, that's right. You got to laminate. And you got the carbon stuff to put in between? I don't know. We've got to look for it yet. Yeah. Uh, well, we got it around here somewhere. Yeah. If not, I know where it'll be in Chickie's cage. But that is a good trick, laminating, getting one piece the right size and shape, and then laminating it in. You finally found the carbon? Yeah. Ooh, you lucky dog. What? I know you I bought lucky it. Dog. I know you did. I bought it. That's from uh, George. Yeah. All right. Now that we got true edges, hmm. we, where's that little block you have? Do we get it? No, take the slow dry in epoxy. All right. All right. Now what Les is doing is laying out. You need to have two parts and two blanks. So if you cut one more part out, and once we laminate it, and by the way, this is something you can do on any wing. It doesn't matter if you did it on an oval. This is a nice way. It also gives you a nice solid place to mount the bell crank, which is even nicer. Well, these are going to seem like they're they're big and they're heavy, but they actually, I think, we'll, we'll see what they weigh before we glue them in. Well, no matter what, it's weight that's on the CG. It's not weight True. that's out on, a, on the inboard wing tip or something. Exactly right. All right. Again, the whole purpose of what we're doing is to beef up this center piece of the wing in a way that give it a little more strength and structure. See, see what you have to do. You got to decide when you make a wing like this, or any wing, really, it doesn't matter. Is this going to be 
a one season plane or a two season plane or a ten season plane. What we're striving for, maybe it'll be a couple of grams heavier, but what we'd really like to have is that 10, 12, 15 years from now that we're still flying this plane. Now if you look in this picture, and this is this is the 1991, however, the plane was made in 87. So 87, 97, this is a 15 year old plane. You know, Smitty is still flying this plane every day. This plane is still in active service. Well, I don't know how many other planes in this picture. Todd Lee, I think, got a lot of use out of his plane. But a lot of the plane, the pictures in this, they're not in service anymore. And uh, if you're building for the long term, and I want all my planes, I mean, every one, I want them to wind up, I really want them to last a long time. And usually that means they have to be a few grams heavier and maybe at some trade-off to weight, but the longevity is very important to me, and it's very important to Wes. The stuff you got this from George Spar. It's 07 carbon. Right. Yeah, it's just typical stuff. Okay. I like to rough in both sides, even though he has one what side. We need. we need. One side's rough, one isn't. One, two, three, four. We only need two pieces, right? You need two pieces. Okay. And the best way you can make the strongest part ever is to put the carbon between two pieces of wood. That really is ultra, ultra strong, and that's like... Remind me, i got to talk to you about an idea that I had here. That is the offshoot of your nacelles. Oh, those nacelles worked out perfect. The, the shells? Oh, Wait my God. Minute. we we got to find out how much a piece of 64th plywood weighs in relation to how much A piece of sixteenth, or a piece of uh, uh, one eighth balsa weighs. Because I'm thinking. Oh, it's heavier. It's for sure heavier. What? The plywood. I don't think so. Mm, well, we can weigh it up. Four? We'll go cut two pieces and weigh them. I, I like the idea that you weigh them and then you know, not you didn't take Joe Blow's word for it. You getting ready to laminate that up? No, I'm getting ready to cut it. Uh, I'd leave it a little oversized, That's what I did. I and then it grind it on the grinder. Over. Okay. Let's well, put that right on glass. Yeah, I understand the 7,000. Okay, that's cut. unidirectional. All the strength is in one direction. Yeah, the fibers are going lengthwise. One side usually has a, plate, a, a finish that you can attach glue to, and I would say that's the side, but no, I roughen no. it up. No, it's not. When do, you, when do you look at the other side? When this is shiny like this, the glue doesn't stick as well as when it's rough. The rougher, the better. Somewhere we got a thread. No. And all, all, the a all the composite people recommend 80 grit. Get scratches of 80 grit in there. Well, basically, what the way this should happen is we should laminate one side and let it cure and then roughen the other side and laminate the other piece to it. We could do it that way too. Okay, what we did, we took the saran wrap on a table, so that some of this is obviously going to ooze down. The one part that's going to be down at the bottom. You know what? I wish I had done this. Here's your other little piece. Okay, rough it up with some 80 grit, or in this case the carbide. The rougher the better. What they really should do when they make this material is put peel ply there so you would get that, that glue surface. You know, when this stuff comes from George, it's really shiny. You really get a minimum of a glue bond well, on What it. you're getting is you're getting a cure side. Yeah, you don't, you, you know, what believe I, me, that joint would not be as strong as it would be. having some saran wrap on a table just since this is going to have to sit in here overnight we mixed up the rest resin okay you're ready to laminate laminate and lunch the two big L's L and L hey bird chicky go over there and help less and you got all those Tom Morris weights 
Pile them on, baby. Well, wait a minute. Well, you, you, you see how much epoxy we got left here? I don't know. Come on, get your, turn the camera off. Start painting all uh, up the other side. Come okay, on. get going. Oh, what the thing is, you got to keep the keep it clean, otherwise you're going to load up the sanding block. Okay, time for paint it on. There's no point skimping on it because when you put on the weight on that, it's going to ooze don't out. Don't forget these things get tapered, so you're going to lose yeah. the weight of it right it's there. It's going to ooze out whatever you don't have. Tom Morris is iron railing. He goes around the neighborhood cutting people's iron railing up and then selling it for weights. It's, <laughs> it's a magnificent idea. It works because, fine. Yeah, those work. But I wish for laminating, rather than using half-inch square stock, he made them three inches by either three-quarter square or one-inch square when you're going to lay up uh, the front end of a fuse crutch or something like that when you're laminating the yeah. boilers. That makes it... Uh, super easy. That's what I think they worked out. I think they worked out great. Yeah. You know, I would never mention to anybody that you got a half a can of spackle in there. But nobody will know. <laughs> Spackle's cheap. Come on, epoxy boy. I'm getting hungry. I can smell that pizza. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Easy for you to say. Yeah, now that's the important thing. There you go. Right okay. And just get that under plenty of weight. Here, put some more Put some more saran wrap so your, your yeah. Tom Morris iron railing doesn't stick to it. Yeah, but I, what I want to do is make sure, Wendy, that we got, that this doesn't move around once we got it down. Okay. Now you can play 20 little Indians with these guys. It would be fun to do with these is right along the road and, you know, some guy behind you gives you a hard time, he's a little too close, throw one out the window. Yeah. And right, powered by Tom Morris on. <laughs> All right. With my luck, the guy's an off-duty cop. Oh, yeah. He runs the license. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's the immigration service and you get deported and, back to uh, Uzbekistan or wherever the hell we come from. Come on, put that saran wrap. And we do 20 years in Joliet. Make sure you use the the wonderful, the wonderful saran wrap. And now it's Lincoln Logs with Tom's Iron Railing. I can just see all these guys in Alabama with the balusters missing out of their railing. Oh, man, Tom, we love you, guy. Keep doing that newsletter. Don't quit. Oh, uh, you know, that man is a saint. Yeah, and better than that. If he ever dies, we're going to run it. We're going to stuff him. We'll have him stuffed and have him. Nice. <laughs> keep just keep him in the AMA museum. Just, just show Tom, we love you, guys. Our real appreciation. Oh, yeah. Thanks for all those years of doing it. Like, we got, for that, we're going to send you to a taxidermist. Probably down in Alabama, there's plenty of you guys that do that work, too. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, man. Talk about irreverence. Bless you, terrible. That's me, Mr. Terrible. Mr. Terrible. Just I'm remember... I'm just dying to go to lunch, and he's the, playing musical the iron the railing answer. here. Try and shift the blame. Just remember the man who... I am that. so hungry, I could eat your slice of pizza. <laughs> You're always... Oh, hungry. man, I am starving, baby. Pizza, pizza, pizza. Just remember the, the guy who, when we were talking about Tom Morris, the first guy who said taxidermist. <laughs> I'm going to put in a newsletter you suggested we stuff him. Right. My buddy, Wendy. My pal, my friend. Not one person in Alabama has balusters on their front railing yet. Tom sawed them all up. It's probably got Dale Berry or somebody sawing these things up. Hey, listen. If oh, it works. man. If it works. Hey, however you, can, take however you can make a fortune overnight. Oh, uh, me? Overnight. So I need to be able to I can't do any work until you get, until you get this wing out of the way. You're holding up Bomber Production, so to speak. Oh, good. Bomber Production. Look at this. We could be working on bombers today, and instead we're All making right, iron railings. Take a little watch the pour here. Oh, God. Um, we're back from lunch. The truth can be known. <laughs> belt, yeah. belt, belt. Anyway, let's cut the trailing edge off. Now, there are certain secrets that we can't talk about about lunch. 
Oh, no. No, no, no. We don't talk about lunch. Did we tell any secrets at lunch? Secrets. I the secrets of the modeling trade. I'm not already. <laughs> All that stuff we swore to secrecy. Uh, the, the swearing's going right swear, out the door. You don't have to swear anyone to secrecy anymore. <laughs> Nobody can remember it. <laughs> All right, anyway, you're going to put the trailing edge on this while I go get Karen because of the ice storm. I have to go pick Karen. I love when I get storm. back, the trailing edge is going to be on this beautifully, and then we're going to be able to sheet, put those middle pieces. No, they got to let them dry overnight. Ooh, just something go. And Mike said by next week he's going to be ready to put the nacelles on his bomber. Right. <laughs> Not exactly. That's way cool. Well, that, that venting looks great, huh? I think you've got enough exhaust air there. Now, I would love to figure and out. You, you put, you put, uh... Oh, you airbrush the, uh, the stains coming out of there? That's going to look pretty nice when it's done. You know, the formers in the back with all those holes and everything, those are really are a work of art. Oh, oh, uh, in the mirror. Oh, yeah. Cool. Now, look, to be a member of Bomber Command, you have to get busy on this model. There's no, no fooling around. All right. Well, you have to go home this afternoon, no, no playing, no fooling. Anyway. That takes no. all the fun out of it. No, 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 no Here we are in total. For my work week. Not a, no work week. You should have Rob running the business. You should retire. Let Rob run the business. Less prepared the trailing edge so we could use a much thinner piece of wood and the little hinge blocks the way we've been doing it. I made them up a bell crank. Then it was with the lead outs on. And the only trouble is Karen and I are going to the home show tomorrow just to get out of the house and get out of this icy cold winter and walk around and see something beside the inside of this house. So we'll see what Les gets done if he does get to come over tomorrow. He's got his laminated spar ready, his trailing edge, and boy, I would highly recommend anybody building a similar wing to this, beef up the middle of the wing, reinforce it.
do today, make a little storyboard on something called span loading. And this is what I understand, and this has been explained to me by Dave Downey, of course who works for Boeing. So I'm assuming this is relatively high-tech stuff, but I was even able to understand it. Now, a good way to a good way to understand span loading, if this is the wing, and this is the point at which the fuselage, let's pretend it's here, this is span loading. In the up mode and the down mode, it wants to bend the wing. In fact, if we take a slow, please. What, what happens in span loading is you're generating lift on the top side of the wing when the flaps come up, the flaps go down, I should say, and the wing wants to bend. All wings, no matter what you make them out of, they want to bend. Well, the problem you have here is with different types of construction, and in speaking to Dave Downey, we were, we were talking about some of this when we did the B-25, span loading in an ideal world, you would be generating lift on all of the surfaces equally. And both of the panels, well, I guess this would be easier to show them from the front to understand what span loading is. Let's pretend we were looking at this right from the front, center of the wing. We want to generate lift, in e and of course it goes in the opposite way when you're flying inverted or doing outside maneuvers. But the essence of span loading is it wants to do this to the wing. Now, a high aspect wing, it's even more critical. Let's say you have a nobler wing. A nobler is typically about five to one. And modern stun ships are about six to one. Well, what happens as you increase the aspect ratio, and that means how long it is relative to the, the span relative to the cord, a high aspect, let's, let's write this out. What happens with a high aspect when you're really generating, you've got a leverage arm and an efficiency. This is a very inefficient wing. The, the shorter you make a wing, the less efficient it is. It's why gliders are always very long and narrow. So what happens, you're generating more lift and it's on a bigger lever arm. So span loading is something that in all modern ships, you have to take it into account. Now on older ships, where the aspect ratio is less. The lower aspect planes, mm, I would say a less critical. But high aspect, and all modern planes are higher aspect, whether it's Ted's plane, and Impact, the Cardinal, and SV-11, they're all a higher aspect, I think, than a nobler. I think the exception would be Billy Warwick's design. And maybe not, I think Billy's Thunderbolt even has a high aspect wing. Higher aspect wing. But anyway, to, to understand what's happening and why wings break and why Les is spending a lot of extra time to try to beef up the center of this wing, because we don't want to wind up with a span loading where all of the stresses are concentrated in one area. And usually that area on a foam wing is the center of the wing. I don't want to have all of the stresses concentrated there. Or in the second worst scenario, that they're concentrated right outside of the body. The third worst scenario is where you have the sheeting on a D-tube or any built-up wing. Right here is the stress riser, where that sheeting ends. Now you can do your own test. Even if a plane is built, buffed out, and you've already flown it, you can get an idea of how good the span loading in your design is. You put this end on a pillow, hold this end, and what I'm showing here is have it off the table, is bend it. Now, it's, it's going to bend. Now, where it's going to bend is critical. If you get an equal bend where the whole thing is, I'll just use an analogy of a bow and arrow. This piece of wood looks like it's bending equally. And that's what's supposed to happen in a wing, is whatever amount of deflection you have, it's going to bend equally. What you don't want to have is where, and this is the worst of all scenarios, this is how I've broken several wings in the past, is I'd carbon fibered them up to here. The MIG was a good, I think I showed a picture of that on this tape rating. The, the MIG 
was carbon fiber like this. So now what happens is you build a span loading stress riser right here. In other words, here's what happens. You're, you're flying along. Let's get this out of here. And nothing's bending up to here. And so this has to bend twice as much. You see what happens? So when you do carbon fiber, my suggestion is, or if you're going to beef up a wing, the best of all worlds is beef the whole thing equally. The other thing that I learned, and this is really something, you, I, I guess this is you know one of those lessons that once you learn it, you only have to learn it once, by the way. You make a built-up wing, and you do this, and you got all the ribs here. Doesn't matter what design it is. And now, with the fuselage in place, now you go, you check the span loading, you do this test, and right here, when you bend it, what happens, you'll see a wrinkle in a silk span right here. Well, wherever you see the wrinkle in a silk span, that's your stress riser. That's where it goes from the point where it's not bending to where it's bending too much. It's called the, the span loading stress riser. Right there is where it's going to be a problem. Well, in the wings that are similar to the one that Les is building that I've seen break, what happens? They just flat out shear right there. And I've seen several of them. And that's what ha And it has nothing to do with if it's a geo wing or a built up wing or an I-beam wing. It's the stress riser. It's the area where all the bending is concentrated. Now, the way to get around this, one of the ways, if you look at some of my designs, and I kind of started out originally, I'll just say, with the MIG. And that's what, that's what I wound up with. And I did the test after the plane was already built and buffed out. Or the best of all worlds is if you can do it before you cover the wing, but of course you don't have the tissue on. You can see that it bends right here. A better way is take the sheeting and let this sheeting just go out. And this is what Les is doing. Make it a bigger piece. This sheeting should not be, not have a corner in it. It's the corner where the stress riser is going to be. So if you make this shape, and if you go look at a cardinal plan or any, some of the designs I have anyway, that's, a, that's just a good way to do it. Now if by doing that piece in both sides, which is what Les is doing, it gives you this area here that's very strong. But what it does also, rather than being a point where it's strong and then it's not strong, in other words, it's not a thing where this whole thing is beefed and now this is doing this. Well, what happens is this kind of distributes the, the span loading stress riser out there. Now, on a, just to make this go one step further, if you had a foam wing, and Les has got his foam wing finished, just a question of we got to get some time to work on it. In the old days, many times I s I've seen these break. What people would do is inside the fuselage side, just put a, let's call it a Band-Aid of, you know, half ounce cloth, one ounce cloth, doesn't matter. But what would happen right at the end, several of these break, right out here they would break. This would be the stress riser. Well, Jim Greenaway years ago came up with his system of the ellipses. And remember, if you can't break the high point of the wing, you can't break the wing. And I would put these ellipses on and, of course, add the piece here. And what that does, it distributes the span loading. So you don't have a place where it just ends. You don't have what caused the MIG to fail. And this system, and this is on the Cardinal plan, it's on all my plans that, have, that show foam wings, beautifully distributes this out. To be honest, to be truly, truly honest, this is the only system I've ever seen that I've never seen even one fail. And the only way this can fail is if people do this when they're, when they're sanding their wing, and I'm exaggerating, and they, they block sand and make a, a very thin piece in the middle. So what I always suggest people do, as soon as you get done glassing it and do a very gentle sanding, put masking tape where the body is going to be. Don't sand inside where the body is going to be. And certainly don't take down that high point. That is a critical, critical thing. But anyway, if you, if you can get a feel for just how this works, because the same thing works on the stab and elevators too, is you're trying to spread the load and not concentrate everything in one area. 
And I think the time and energy that Les is putting into this is really going to pay big dividends. I think in modeling, you have to, when you start the construction of a model, you have to make a decision early, early in the program. A lot of people, the best one I know is Jimmy Casal, who used to build a lot of planes. I think he built 30 or 40 planes in a very short amount of time. But basically, most of them had a very limited lifespan. They were built to be, I guess what you would call competition only planes with no thought given to longevity. And maybe that was a good, th it certainly was good for Jimmy because he had the energy and time to build more planes. But in my case, this would not work for me because to me, when the planes are done, I want to still have them. Or in worse scenarios, I want to be able to repair them or I want to give them away. But I want them to be forever. I want them to be around 15, 20 years from now, and a lot of my planes, you know, whether I like it or not, they are. They're going to outlive me. There's a reality to this. They are going to outlive me. But when you, when you, and of course, the, the decision is, this would probably be people that are looking to fill shelves with trophies, if trophies are important to you, and this is people that really enjoy, really enjoy every day at the flying field. So you have to decide where you fit in this scheme of things. The thing is, I think you can really have the best of both worlds in a lot of times. In a limited life sand plane, there's a lot of things you can do to lighten them up. And I've seen any anything from drilling holes in motor mounts to uh, <laughs> leaving parts out to using thin lead outs to, you can name it. But, but almost everything that gives this plane its limited lifespan is because people have gone over the limit of lightening them up. However, when you're doing a forever plane, you accept the fact it might be a half ounce or three quarters of an ounce heavier, but, but there's low risk things. And an example of that is, if you put one less coat of clear on a plane, it's a low risk thing. It's not going to, not going to hurt the plane. The plane will just probably be a quarter of an ounce lighter. It's low risk. You can undo it. You can wipe the plane off and pe put the paint back on. When you do things like drilling holes in places or lightening parts up or making things way too thin that you can't get back in and do them. For instance, if you took the bell crank bolt and decide you want to make it out of aluminum tubing instead of music wire, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, uh, yeah, you may get 10 flights or 100 flights, or in some cases, people get an, uh, an incredible amount of time out of things before they break. But in my case, when I'm looking at these things, I want to do things that maybe would lighten up the plane some, but also be a very low risk. There's very a very low chance that they're going to fail. I also, whenever there's a decision to be made, and I want to go... I want to go with X or Y, I look at the decision and I say, well, Y would make the plane, let's say, a gram or two lighter, drilling a hole somewhere or doing something that, that you know is kind of experimental. But if I do X, hundreds of guys have done X before, it's worked for every one of them, there's never been a problem. I almost always go with the X, again, because it's proven experimental stuff on planes that take hundreds of hours to build is really, well, not my first choice anyway. Now, this all would be very, if, if you had rules to follow, this all would be fun, but what you have, a lot of people, they go out and do something that works for them. They drill a hole in the motor mounts. They, they do a certain thing or, or whatever they do to lighten up a plane. And it works for them because they've compensated in some other way. For instance, years ago, people used to drill holes in the motor mounts, or they, they would take the motor mounts and it would just be a, 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 a turn it into, but then they would fiberglass the nose. And so the weight they saved here maybe was not even, was even less than, and I think, I'm just using Jimmy as an example because I knew his planes intimately, but he glassed the nose. Well, what happens here is, this is only a couple of grams. If you weigh what you save here, you're talking tiny amount. The glass adds a tiny amount. Sometimes it's a trade-off. But if you don't drill the holes and also glass the nose, see what happens? It's proven. Now you know there's no way at the end of 300 hours of working, you start the engine and it's going to vibrate. So there's a lot of things. Another thing too is 
all of the, all of the things that we do to make motor mount crutches, there would be any infinite amount of things, of ways to lighten them up. I've used saw cuts. They seem to work reasonably well. Glue in the tank shim in seems to work well. Filling the, the gap between the mounts with cross grain wood. This, this is all proven stuff. But as long as you can, and the aluminum pads are a must. And what happens when you know this works? Yeah, it's maybe uh, these are things that have worked hundreds and hundreds of times. Now you go and put it into your new plane, it's kind of like it's proven. But when you take a plane and say an example I'm going to use, and it's a funny example. Somebody showed me one time that they had made a motor mount crutch out of pine. Now pine is relatively light. <laughs> but it isn't hardwood, believe me. And I, I'm not sure that plane had a, a very long, exciting life at all, but I don't think the majority of people went over to, to do pine. So, in the case of us making carbon crutches and making different experimental things, before they wind up going into a forever plane, I want them to be proven. Again, that word proven goes a long way. And if you can eliminate wing fracturing and breaking, that's the biggest single culprit of people that don't think about engineering too much. The second one is somehow figuring out a way of lightening up the nose of the plane. And then the ultimate killer is when you do these kind of things, you always wind up with an ounce of nose weight anyway. You don't want to outsmart yourself on a plane that's going to take that long to build. So I hope those little things are, uh, well, just a little food for thought anyway. today's mail talk about a good engineer here's a good friend Dub and Donna Jett and we're going to be seeing them in about uh, oh, less than two months we're going to be getting on that big bird for Houston and I know Dub you're going to impress the hell out of me with that motor making stuff and I hope we're going to be able to get some of the exciting adventure on video so boy you don't want to miss that part of it that's going to be a great adventure this was a really, really valuable lesson. And I, when I have something fail, I'm not embarrassed to share it with people. Here's what had happened. I had somebody, I won't mention any names, tell me that they had a great machine where they worked that they could, they could basically solder the horns up with some experimental high-tech solder. Well, I gave them the horns that ultimately wound up in this plane. At that point in time, we didn't make them in production. And they made me a tail horn that was very, very light. And I looked at it and I said, geez, I don't know. You know, that looks, oh, it's light, it's light, it's light, it's light. Well, needless to say, this was an excellent plane. This was Big Jim Greenaway's, one of his favorite planes. And the horn broke in service. And the plane crashed. So that then was uh, 21 days before the 1985 Nats. And I decided I would learn my lesson, put in proven parts, and build a kind of a replica, a very similar replica of it. it. Took me 21 days to build it and buff it out. And it went on to become the 1985 Concourse winner. And it had a very, very, very long life. Again, because I didn't get too cute. I just took all stuff that I already knew was going to work and that other people had done no experimental soldering joints on the horns, no experimental lightweight things. And the plane had an incredibly long contest life. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flights. And was a concourse winner and got fifth place at the Nats. Now that, that plane is up in this picture, which is behind one of my radio speakers in the shop. But just as a reminder, I blocked myself out here. But Jimmy, and I mean, it has nothing negative to say about Jimmy. Jimmy was one of the top competitors in my book of all time, but he really went through a lot of airplanes. They really were not the kind of planes I would want to build, but certainly they suited his needs well. He won a whole, a whole lot more contests than I did, but, but in the end, I still have all the airplanes. So I don't know if there's a, there's a message there. I'm not sure. And I, I wouldn't debate it. I'm, not, I'm really not sure. I mean, just one example, the original Strega is still down in Texas, and hopefully we'll see him down there unless Richard drives a truck over him or something. A plane that's been repaired, a plane that's had an unbelievably long life, and probably still, still
school flight is good enough that a lot of people would enjoy flying it. Okay, so those are just my thoughts for the day. And as always, that's how I've experienced the world of model aviation in 51 years. And your experience may be totally different, but that's what, that's what actually has happened to me. A lot of hard lessons to learn, and hopefully a lot of them I've been able to pass on to other people along the way. Now tonight I got a couple hours, and I thought I'd lay, lay out one of the parts the tail cone of the uh, nacelles. And as I took this this pad up, one of the things I wanted to show, oops, here's one right here. See what happens, there's a hard spot here. And I just keep picking them off. Because what they'll do is when the wing has got a final sanding, they'll be rough on it. Now, of course, what you do is when one side gets unusable, you flip it over, use the other, use the other side, or just use the, by, the back of it, but we've done the majority of building on several planes on this one piece here, and I'm just running my hand, here's another piece here. And if you don't get these pieces off, they have CA especially. As you're working, there's always pieces of CA that fall in there. That can really be a nuisance. Now the next part on this nacelle operation I have to lay out is this back part. You'll notice there's going to be a cutout for the wing. And because the ring has dihedral, each side of it is going to be different. So what I thought would be the easiest way is to cut a block oversize. I'll make a pattern for this shape. Cut a block oversize. And then try to get the notches in the ring so that this would slide right up in position on the wing. And then I could trace around the edge of the nacelle. So that part would be done. Then from that point on, I can just rough out this part, tack glue it in position, do the final shaping, so I try to build this in my mind. Then of course cut it off, hollow it out, and I'll probably have to put several seams in the block, try to get it hollowed out, but, but that what that's going to give me hopefully is a real accurate seam here and an accurate seam on the wing where the wing is going to have a dihedral and a sweep change. So one side of this is going to be much longer than the other because of the sweep and the dihedral in the wing. So the first step is going to be, and this ought to be a lot of fun, is look around and see what kind of balsa we can use up, hopefully with as few seams as possible, to make that part of the nacelle. Get up this pattern. This, of course, because it's a round cross section, it's four and a half inches in both dimensions. But getting these notches in exactly the right spot is going to be a little tricky. The first part is going to be, and this is a much bigger block than the B-25, so there'll be a lot more carving and hollowing before this is done. In fact, this is going to probably wind up being a relatively big, unexpectedly big job. Now, as luck would have it, I wound up found this block out in the garage. It's this 3.8 super light. We were using this for some kind of a jig or something. I'm not sure what. It feels real light on one side, but not on the other. So I'm not sure. I'm not going to use that as the primary one. I have these, but these are all really rough, but you can see that they're really soft wood. These are really going to be nice if I can use them. What I'm going to have to do, though, and I luckily had one real nice, this is, I don't know, a two by, is it a two by, a three by three? A nice three by three that I can get one, two, probably three of the nacelles out of this. In fact, if I put this together, I'm wondering if I can get the whole nacelle out of it. The idea is to eliminate as many of the, uh, ooh, just close anyway. So the next step on this is going to be to try to rough out with the jigsaw or with by hand four pieces that are going to be the four blanks. Four, since these are symmetrically tapered, I think four. Boy, I wish I could get four out of one piece. One, two. The gods are not smiling upon me today. Well, we're going to have to find out where we're going to get four pieces. Now, what that'll do, that'll allow me to have. 
just one seam and I'll try to put the seam where the I don't want it up on top I want it on the side if possible I mean I can cover it with the fillet or somehow we can disguise that seam and you'll only see it very little in the back now I do remember and of course I've looked at the video I do remember a lot of work this block is a lot smaller but I remember that being a couple of days of carving and sanding so I guess the best thing here is not to get excited that I'm going to get this done in one or two sessions but just tough it out and try to get as few seams in it and try to bury the seams where nobody will see them if possible for the things that we're not going to be able to do this is not going to fit in the jigsaw throat so the second choice is going to be to use a coping saw but for sure on a job like this absolutely want to get a new blade in here no matter what the price is if you try to use up an old blade it's going to be hard to get these cuts straight anyway but a, a new blade is just going to give us a little bit of an edge now I guess I guess I could scribe a 90 degree line on this, but I don't, I don't think I have to. I can chew it up over on a bandsaw. The best thing is always just cut it just a little bit oversize. In this case, it's about an eighth of an inch. I'll cut everything an eighth of an inch oversize. And if all else fails, we just have to cut it out with a coping saw. Even though this is a rough way to do it, that's probably going to be the most realistic way. this out and believe me I tried this a thousand different ways like a jigsaw puzzle what's going to happen is I need more material and I was hoping I could do this with one piece of block so I'd only have two seams but even that's not going to work I'm going to have to cut four pieces up so what I'm going to have to do is just basically this will cut in a jigsaw anyway I'm going to wind up with a seam on every side, but in lieu of having any bigger blocks, I guess that's all I have. But rather than fooling around, wasting time, I know I'm going to have to tack all these blocks up. May as well just get right on with it. And usually when you're carving a block this big, say it's a cowling, a cowling would even be another example of it. Well, there's just no reasonable way. There's always a seam in it, or almost always anyway. But anyway, I know I need four of these, so there's, again, there's just no point in fooling around, even though we're trying to, uh, trying to maximize our efficiency here, but I was really hoping I'd be able to do this with two pieces, but what I'd need is, is tremendous size blocks, and I don't have any that big, so I just gonna, I'm just going to have to live with this. I really can get one, two, there's going to be two seams in this no matter how I do it. And again, these blocks at least have a, uh, an ability to be cut. So I guess I just have to, I just have to be resigned to the fact this is going to be a, a much bigger job than the B25 was. These blocks, first of all, are much bigger. As they get exponentially bigger, they get more and more difficult to find pieces of wood that you can carve without laminations and without joints. But at least, at least this half of the parts you can cut out. Now what I did, I just tacked some of these together, roughly. I'm going to try to make this part, and I left a good, 
good three sixteenths of an inch on each side from the side that we actually need and I'll even leave that line on. I want to make this plenty big. I just want to rough this out, just get it to a rough shape. And the parts where we do this, of course, I can hack off with the, the coping saw and then I want to just get all of the material that I can off of these corners. The thought is, for the first one, I made up a bunch of extra pieces with the material I had. For the first one, just to do it as a test, just get everything as rough as possible, leave it way oversized. Because once this is tacked in place, then I can get the last fit on it. I don't want to bring it up and it's going to be well, either a little bit too small or a lot too small. Again, there aren't, there aren't many pretty ways to do this. I wish there were, of course. And when you want to try to use up material we already have, the problem is if I ordered bigger material, bigger blocks, the odds are good it's not going to come in lightweight wood. This wood is, I've had this wood for over 20 years, and I don't throw even a small piece of it away, because you just can't get big blocks made out of light material anymore. Yeah, and just by, just by hacking off as much of that as possible, one right after another, taking slices off like slicing bread, then we're going to try to go over and take some of this off on the belt sander when we're done. I've made this plenty oversized so that when we actually start carving it, we're about at least an eighth of an inch bigger in every dimension than we have to be. Just want to get the rough idea of how that's going to look. We can always use this as our pattern. Now I can trace that same pattern on here if I want to. I really don't have to. I can kind of do it by eye. And we're just going to start removing a little bit of material at a time with a 26 blade. I want to block this big. It's just, there's just no substitute. A new blade with a couple of cups of coffee going. Because we're going to have a lot of hours of carbon here. I can see that. And I'm just trying to determine if this wood is going to be the quality that I want. I don't want to have wood that's really not going to hold its shape. Oh, this looks pretty good. And the trick with all carbon is just not to try to take too much off in one time. Work toward the lines, work toward the center lines. Anyway, I see we are by the meter here. I see we're coming near the end of the video. And I don't want to be in the middle of doing anything really critical. I want to thank Bill Zimmer again for sharing that footage with us. It's just fabulous stuff. But if that doesn't if that doesn't bring back memories of the world gone by, wouldn't you love to be down by the Rutherford train station someday and see one of those Santa Fe diesels come by? When the 614 used to go through town, they had thousands of people down. It was unbelievable. A lot of people have their hearts back in that nostalgia. Anyway, we enjoyed the real loading, real real loading, and we enjoyed the model real loading. Just like we enjoy real aviation. I'd love if Warren Walker would take me for a ride in a Mustang. Anyway, that's pretty much what's going to be going on here for the next giant amount of hours anyway. Just going to work one corner at a time, leaving it plenty oversized, and then we have to put that notch in for the ring. Slide this right up on the former and trace the actual line. I just would like to get as much roughed off as I can before I actually have to cut those notches for the ring. Little by little, we got half of it roughed out in this little time, but now see what we have to do is start working on the contour so that we have the same contour 
But getting all that material, even if we just get that done tonight, that'll be one big step for mankind, one big metal chip from wood chip for mankind. This is the secret to getting these these big carving jobs done. And they're working on a third side now, and it's starting to really come together. I hope uh, before we finish this up, before we retire tonight, in fact, that we're going to have that in rough, rough shape, ready to cut the notch for the wing. Here's one of the things that you can do when you have to make two parts relatively the same. Well, what I did, I took a piece of this is just ordinary art paper and made a cut that was about a quarter of an inch bigger than the part has to be. And now what you can see is, as you start shaping it, you can try to lay this in and see where your hard spots are. And you always want to make it a little bit bigger to start with. And I'll let me just show you why. And this really, this really does save a lot of time. Now, because this is a symmetrical, see where I need to take more material off? Now, once this piece in all dimensions, once it fits in here in all dimensions, then I'll make a piece a quarter inch smaller. Again, it's just pieces of paper. And then get the final fits so that I can, uh, yeah, I can see where I need to remove material this way. And the second thing is I'll save these, so this will be step one, step two, step three, as far as getting the parts symmetrical. This will help, so I don't have one they sell, a, you know, so a big cucumber. If I don't have one, see this one really, you can spot right now where the hard spots are. Remember, just like sheetrock work, find the hard spots and nip away at them. And as the days go by, we just keep loading up the garbage can with chips. I wish I could sell this stuff. We could sell it to somebody. So once you have step one, and I've marked that, of course, we're down a quarter of an inch now. And we can use the second piece. Now, again, Mike is going to need these to make his tail cones and things too. So we have that quarter of an inch. And I think that's about the final amount. Now, if we need a third one, we can make the final one. These are just to rough it in. These are really rough. The third one would be maybe an eighth of an inch. And then the final one, maybe I'll make one out of 64th plywood to get the final fit so that they are exactly symmetrical in the dimensions that are really going to matter. Again, that's a way you could do anytime you have to make two parts relatively the same. Or in this case, you know, you need to we need to get these very, very similar, or it'll be pretty obvious we've we've left something out. And there's no trick to just just keep carving. The meaning of life is at the end of that carving and the end of a, a package of XL blades. Now as I'm carving away here, Karen comes down to tell me it's time to go to bed. And she says, what the hell are you making? A thing for cone heads? The more I look at it, maybe I am making cone heads here. Tail cone, cone heads. Anyway, a little... We're, we're in the middle of phase two here. We're trying to get a decent fit on it. Little by little, it's coming along. And even though, uh, if if you look at the video, you, this only takes a minute or two or five minutes to go through. This this was a lot of work because I'm really trying hard to get that. Constantly looking over my shoulder at the picture of the real airplane and everything that that we're doing on the. But on this model and on a B-25, try to make it as scale-like as possible, of course. And we just keep filling up garbage can after garbage can with more chips. More chips! Chips, chips! <clears throat> as we get down to the final little amount, and I've got this kind of the shape I want it, roughly. But remember, that even though I have the shape, the whole thing is really oversized by some amount. So from this point on, I'm trying to get out the knife marks. I could use a razor plane, but this is just as easy to do it this way. Just so I can hold this up 
to the back of the nacelle. There's a rough spot there. And try to get the last little bit, constantly checking it with my little I know, step two gauge, I guess is a good way to put it. But at some point in time, you can't really take big chunks out. It's ice shavings. I call it ice shavings. Trick, trick is never to hold the knife totally 90 degrees. Always hold the knife on a, and roll it. You see how the parts roll off? If you hold this at 90 degrees, it doesn't really want to cut on an angle cuts much easier especially when you're doing the final cutting the ice shaving now when I'm done I can almost get to the point where I have very little almost no sanding if I just do ice shavings and the nice thing about ice shavings is almost no dust much less dust for Karen and Karen has a lot of trouble of course dealing with the dust but again because we're coming up on the end of the tape I was hoping I'd finish at least one of these parts, but uh, you know, still a lot of carving to do. Still, we've got a, at least at least one whole day of fitting this up, so we're not going to get it all on this tape like I had hoped. But just ice shaving it up, cone heads. I like that. Well, this is all we're going to get done tonight. It looks like we got the beginning of one pretty much roughed out. Probably have another day or two to get the other one up to that step, but I don't want to be in the middle of carving and cutting when we run out of video. So really, thanks for joining us. Really hope you've enjoyed uh, the little train episode too. That was just fabulous. And we hope we'll see you on the next tape. Please share the tapes as always. And it's just nice to know that Strig is down in Texas. And it may be we'll get another 10 years out of it. I'm not sure. But I really always think it's worth building models that are going to stand the test of time. I'm happy to say that Joe Rushki is doing well, very well. We're making him up a tune pipe for his Australia that he's building right now. Jerry, it was good talking to you. I'm glad to hear your health is back. and glad to see Steve Busso's back. And I hope very, very soon I'll be 100% too. This has really been probably the coldest and craziest winter we've ever had. But having a great thing to do with your spare time, like modeling, has just made it just go as pleasantly as possible and the friends you develop in this this event of ours just seems to carry you through the tough times anyway we'll see you on the next tape enjoy